Houdini, a name that may ring a bell in your mind, but you might not be aware of the extent of his fame and his impact on the world of magic. But fear not, today is your opportunity to understand more about the person behind the name. I will be your guide in this journey through time, giving color to the black and white past to finally meet the man who could escape from anything and became a legend. On March 24, 1874, in Budapest, Hungary, Eric Weiss was born. His parents were Cecilia Steiner and Mayor Samuel Weiss, a rabbinical lawyer and sometimes soap maker. This family had seven children, and Eric was the fourth boy. During Eric's fourth year, the Weiss family immigrated to the United States, settling in the progressive small town of Appleton, Wisconsin, where Mayor Samuel had secured work as a rabbi on an earlier trip. Here, Eric developed an interest in athletics and acrobatics. He performed circus feats in his backyard and called himself Eric, Prince of the Air. At the age of eight, he was impressed by a performance of the English conjurer, Dr. Lynn. Unfortunately, Mayor Samuel lost his job at the Appleton Synagogue and the family had to move to Milwaukee, where they lived in poverty. Eric, who has never educated past the third grade, worked shining shoes and as a messenger boy. When he was 12 years old, he ran away from home, possibly twice. Very little is known about these runaway days, except that he planned to go to Galveston, Texas and went by the name Harry White. He later rejoined his family in New York City. In New York, the teenage Harry landed a job as a tie cutter at H. Richter's Sons. His father also worked a sewing bench for a time. Harry, as a member of the Pastime Athletics Club and Amateur Athletic Union, competed in and won several foot races, boxing matches, bicycle races, and swim meets. It was at this time that Harry read the autobiography of a famous French magician, Memoirs of Robert Houdin, and became fascinated with magic. Adding an I to the name Houdin, he adopted the stage name Harry Houdini and formed an act with his friend and fellow tie cutter Jacob Hyman called The Brothers Houdini. The high point of their act was a substitution trunk trick called Metamorphosis, which Houdini would perform throughout his entire career. Sadly, at the age of 18, Houdini lost his father after an operation for tongue cancer at Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Houdini's real brother, Theodore, also known as Dash, 
soon replaced Hyman in the act. The brothers performed on the Midway at the Columbia Exposition, alongside another future great stage magician, Howard Thurston. In 1894, they were performing in Coney Island when Harry met Wilhelmina Beatrice Rahner, better known as Bess, a showgirl in an act called The Floral Sisters. After only three weeks' courtship, Harry and Bess were married, much to the horror of Bess's strict German Catholic mother, who refused to speak to her daughter and new son-in-law for many years. Renaming the act The Houdinis, Harry and Bess played in beer halls and dime museums and traveled with circuses and medicine shows throughout the U.S. and Canada. Sometimes they performed comedic playlets as The Rahners, America's greatest comedy act. To make ends meet, Harry also performed a solo magic act as The King of Cards, or Cardo, and masqueraded as Progea, the Wild Man of Mexico in a circus sideshow where his sleight-of-hand skills made it appear as if he ate cigarettes thrown into his cage. He later co-managed an ill-fated burlesque show called The American Gaiety Girls. Despite an engagement at Tony Pastor's popular vaudeville theater in New York, the couple found little success with their magic act. Harry tried to sell his entire show, including his original handcuff act and metamorphosis in 1898. There were no buyers. Houdini received his big break in 1899, when vaudeville impresario Martin Beck saw his act at the Palm Garden Beer Hall in St. Paul, Minnesota, and booked him in the National Keith Orpheum Circuit. Houdini promoted his appearances by escaping from handcuffs and jail cells in local police stations, notably in San Francisco and Chicago where he performed his escapes in the nude to prove he had no keys. His escapes drew headlines in local papers. Following the successful run, Beck arranged for a European tour, but when Harry and Bess arrived in London in early 1900, they discovered the bookings had not been secured. Impressing the manager of the Alhambra Theatre, reportedly by escaping from handcuffs at Scotland Yard, Houdini was booked for a trial run. During his first performance, he was unexpectedly challenged on stage by a rival escape artist, Cernok. Houdini bested the challenger with a pair of bean giant handcuffs. Soon, Houdini's exploits, both on stage and off, caught the attention and imagination of the public. Houdini, who had told the American press that he was Austrian, now emphasized an American lineage, billing himself as the elusive American. From this point on, he would forever claim to have been born in Appleton, Wisconsin on April 6. His Hungarian birth would not be publicly revealed until after his death. Houdini, the handcuff king, became a sensation, breaking attendance records in every theater he played throughout England, Scotland, and Wales. In one theater, the doors had to be removed to accommodate the massive crowds. Houdini claimed in some cities, patrons rioted for tickets. At the London Hippodrome in 1904, Houdini was challenged by the London Daily Mirror newspaper to escape a specially made handcuff that was said to have taken a Birmingham locksmith several years to construct. 
He freed himself from the mirror handcuff in a dramatic 90-minute ordeal. Exactly how he escaped is still hotly debated today. Houdini's success continued abroad, where he drew sold-out crowds in Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Russia. His escape from a Siberian transport cell and his defiance of German police in court became the stuff of legend. He also added a dash of death defiance to his outdoor stunts by leaping into rivers while handcuffed. Capitalizing on his success, he brought his brother and former partner Dash to Europe and set him up as a rival handcuff king by the name of Hardeen. Together, the brothers dominated the European vaudeville circuits. It was Dash who discovered the power of escaping from a straitjacket in full view of the audience. Houdini quickly adopted the technique and made it a signature performance. Houdini also embraced the new medium of motion pictures. He filmed his outdoor stunts, such as his 1907 Rochester bridge jump, and played them as part of his vaudeville turn. In 1909, he made a short narrative film for Cinema Lux in Paris. The film played in the United States as The Celebrated Houdini. Houdini returned to the United States in 1905 as Europe's eclipsing sensation. He quickly established himself by escaping from the Murderer's Row jail cell that once held presidential assassin Charles Gateau. Not only did he escape, but he released all the prisoners and moved them into different cells. Houdini continued to push the boundaries of his challenge act. Now, it wasn't just handcuffs that he could be challenged with. It was anything a person could devise. He freed himself from government mailbags, a giant football, riveted boilers, packing crates, a convict ship, an iron maiden, and even from the belly of a gigantic sea monster that had washed up in Boston Harbor. In New York, he escaped from a packing crate after it was nailed shut and dropped into the East River. He would later escape from a straitjacket while suspended by his ankles hundreds of feet in the air. All his outdoor escapes drew tens of thousands of spectators. Before long, Houdini was the highest paid entertainer in vaudeville and one of the most famous men alive. In 1908, Houdini gave up handcuff escapes and introduced his milk can escape, his own invention. Colorful posters warned that failure means a drowning death. He also built up an impressive library of books on theater, magic, and spiritualism in his large home in Harlem. He drew from this collection in several books that he authored. In 1908, he published a savage expose of his boyhood hero called The Unmasking of Robert Houdin. Houdini called his book the first authentic history of magic ever published. The magic community, however, were not converted, and Robert Houdin's status as the father of modern magic remains intact to this day. The following year, Houdini became fascinated with aviation. He purchased a French-made Vision biplane and flew expeditions in Germany, England, and France. His aviation exploits culminated when he was recognized as the first man to fly a plane in Australia on March 18, 1910. Ironically, Houdini believed it was for this feat that he would be most remembered. Frustrated by how many imitators were copying his milk can escape, Houdini introduced his most famous stage escape in 1912, the water torture cell, later called the Chinese water torture cell. It would become the staple of his act for the next 14 years. The act was so daring that very few rivals attempted their own versions. 
Even Hardeen never performed it. He was content to work with the milk can for the rest of his career. Houdini was enormously close with his mother, Cecilia, from childhood through adulthood. He considered her a saint and honored a deathbed promise made to his father to always look after her. In 1904, he moved her into a large new family home at 278 West 113th Street in Harlem. He once even requested his salary in gold coins, which he poured into his mother's lap. Cecilia never learned English. She and Houdini communicated in German. Despite being the wife of a rabbi, Cecilia did not speak Yiddish. She understood German, French, Italian, Spanish, and Hungarian only. Also, despite what has been dramatized in some biopics, there was no conflict between Cecilia and Bess. Cecilia later became close with Bess's mother, Balbina, who was also a German-speaking widow with five children. Cecilia Weiss died on July 17, 1913, after suffering a stroke while on vacation with Hardeen in Asbury Park, New Jersey. When the news of her death reached Houdini, who was performing in Copenhagen, he fainted. It took Houdini several days to make it back to New York. The family delayed burial, which is against Jewish custom, so Houdini could have one last look at his mother. He placed in her casket a pair of woolen slippers size 6, which she had asked him to get her in Europe. Houdini's mother's death might have been the single most important event in his life. Those who knew him said he was never quite the same man after her death. He mourned for months. On November 22, 1913, he wrote to his brother, Dash, it's tough, and I can't seem to get over it. Sometimes I feel all right, but when a calm moment arrives, I am as bad as ever. Even with a full seven months after his mother's death, Houdini was still struggling with grief. On January 19, 1914, he again writes to Dash. I can write all right when I keep away from that heart-rendering subject, so we'll try and avoid it if possible. But I have to write to my brother once in a while about her whom we miss and for her with whom I feel as if my heart of hearts went with her. For the remainder of his life, he would grieve and remain morbidly obsessed with death, cemeteries, and whether it was possible to communicate with the dead. After a two-month hiatus, he returned to performing.
That year, Houdini attempted to launch a straight magic show in England called the Grand Magical Review. The show featured several original effects, but the public expected Houdini the escape artist, and he soon folded the show. However, Houdini continued to invent and perform occasional magic, including walking through a brick wall and his famous East Indian needle trick. He also once amazed President Theodore Roosevelt aboard an ocean liner with an effect involving spirit slates. With America's entry into World War I in 1917, Houdini threw himself into the war effort selling war bonds and teaching American soldiers how to free themselves from German restraints. He also starred in a gala review at the New York Hippodrome called Cheer Up. It was here that he famously made an elephant disappear. At another review, Everything, he produced an eagle named Abraham Lincoln from the folds of an American flag. During this time, he also became president of the Society of American Magicians, and had a brief affair with the widow of author Jack London. In 1918, vaudeville was on the wane, as movies became the most popular form of mass entertainment. Houdini, who had dabbled in motion pictures since the turn of the century, signed with producer B. A. Rolfe to star in a 15-part serial, The Master Mystery. The serial is notable in that it featured the very first movie robot called the Automaton. This success of the serial led to Houdini being signed by Jesse L. Lasky, one of the biggest producers in Hollywood. Houdini made two movies for the company, The Grim Game and Terror Island. Both films were distributed by Paramount and featured loose plots meant to showcase a cavalcade of Houdini's famous escapes. While filming an aerial stunt for The Grim Game, two biplanes collided in midair with a stuntman, Robert Kennedy, doubling Houdini dangling by a rope from one of the planes. Publicity was geared heavily towards promoting this dramatic, caught-on-film moment, claiming it was Houdini himself dangling from the plane. Houdini never denied it. Following his two-picture stint in Hollywood, Houdini returned to New York and created his own film production company, the Houdini Picture Corporation. He produced and starred in two films, The Man from Beyond and Haldane of the Secret Service, and made deals to distribute European films with new English intertitles. He also founded his own film laboratory business called Film Developing Corporation, banking on a new process for developing motion picture film. Hardeen left stage performing to run FDC for his brother, but it proved to be an expensive failure, along with Houdini's independent movie-making efforts. In 1922, Houdini vacationed in Atlantic City with Sherlock Holmes creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle was a passionate supporter of spiritualism, which had experienced a resurgence following World War I and was now being touted as a serious religion. Houdini was a skeptic. He had a lifetime of experience with spiritualist trickery, going back to his earliest days in New York when he and fellow pastime athletic club member Joe Wren attended seances to learn the craft. In fact, some of Houdini's earliest rope escapes employed methods used by the Davenport brothers, a pair of early stage mediums. Doyle and Houdini's private debate turned public after Doyle gave him a seance in which he believed his wife had contacted Houdini's mother. 
Their public debate turned ugly and ruined their friendship, but it opened the door to a new career for Houdini as an anti-spiritualist crusader. Houdini threw himself into the task of debunking fraudulent mediums with great energy. He made two nationwide lecture tours in 1924 demonstrating the methods of fraud. He attended seances in disguise, wrote exposés for newspapers, denounced mediums from the stage, and even employed a private secret service of agents who attended seances and collected information for him. He offered $10,000 to any medium who could produce phenomena he could not explain, and also joined several committees of investigators, including a committee for Scientific American magazine. In 1926, he championed a bill before Congress to outlaw fortune-telling in the District of Columbia, but it didn't pass. Houdini's exposés brought him renewed fame, but drew the ire of spiritualists who, by the time of his death, had mounted a total of $2 million worth of lawsuits against him. Houdini's most famous encounter was with Mina Marjorie Crandon, an attractive Boston socialite who performed seances in the nude and produced ectoplasm from her nether regions. When Houdini learned that Scientific American was about to reward her the prize for legitimate phenomena, he canceled his theater engagements and rushed to Boston to sit with her. In a series of highly contentious and controversial seances, Houdini exposed her methods and even constructed a special box to contain her. Despite this, her supporters, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, continued to believe she was genuine. Marjorie's foul-mouthed spirit guide, Walter, predicted Houdini's death within a year. Having performed in vaudeville for his entire career, Houdini fulfilled a dream in August 1925 when he mounted his own full evening roadshow. Billed as three shows in one, the evening featured magic, escapes, and fraudulent mediums exposed. Houdini even purchased the original magic apparatus of Dr. Lin, using it during his show to perform mysterious effects that startled and pleased your grand and great-grandparents. The show played on Broadway and toured with a great success. The following year, Houdini survived for 91 minutes in an airtight coffin submerged in the pool of the Shelton Hotel in New York. He repeated the feat two more times in Worcester, Massachusetts, and performed a Buried Alive stunt on stage in which he escaped from a casket buried under a ton of sand. In October of 1926, while performing in Montreal, Canada, Houdini was punched in his dressing room by a 30-year-old McGill University student named J. Gordon Whitehead. Believing a boast that Houdini could withstand a blow to the stomach, Whitehead struck the magician several times before he was ready. Houdini ignored the pain and increasing fever and pushed on to his next engagement at the Garrick Theatre in Detroit. After struggling through a performance with a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, Houdini gave in to doctor's orders and was rushed to Grace Hospital. Only after Houdini was operated on was it discovered that he had been suffering from appendicitis and that his appendix had ruptured. Peritonitis had set in. 
A second operation and an experimental serum failed to save him. Harry Houdini died at 1.26 p.m. on Halloween, 1926. His last words were said to have been, I'm tired of fighting. Following his death, his wife, Bess, struggled with money, alcohol, and was the target of unethical spiritualists and journalists out to exploit her. She twice attempted suicide. May Bess was first courted by Houdini's younger brother, Dash, but it was Harry that she fell in love with and married. She looked after their menagerie of pets, collected dolls, and made the costumes for Houdini's full evening show. She also said it was her duty to make sure her absent-minded husband was dressed well and had clean ears. In 1930, Bess met Edward Saint, who became her companion and manager. Together, they moved to Hollywood, where they held a final Houdini seance atop the roof of the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. Bess also helped form the Magic Gals, a group of female magicians and enthusiasts which included Gary Larson, the mother of Magic Castle co-founders Bill and Milt Larson. In 1938, she appeared as herself in the film Religious Racketeers. Bess remained a much-loved and respected fixture at magic conventions until her death on February 11, 1943, aboard a train in Needles, California. Houdini achieved more than he ever imagined. He was one of the world's most popular escape artists, magic men, and stunt performers, from his breakthrough in 1899 to his death in 1926, a true star for 27 years. It is truly intriguing, though, to contemplate how Houdini was able to maintain such a high level of popularity and capture the hearts of audiences for such an extended period. One could argue that perhaps his impossible escapes not only provided entertainment, but also served as a source of inspiration and hope for many people in the audience who may have been facing difficult situations in their lives. They could have seen Houdini's escapes as a symbol of overcoming obstacles and the possibility of finding a way out of their own problems. What's for sure is that this connection with the audience has been a significant factor in maintaining Houdini's longevity as a performer and keeping him at the forefront of the world of magic. If you're pleased with the outcome and would like your old photos to receive the same treatment, then you're in luck. By clicking on the link regarding photo colorization provided in the description, I will carefully colorize your photos by hand, paying extra attention to every detail. Of course, there are also AI colorizers available, such as this one, which is currently regarded as the best one among them. At first glance, the AI colorization looks decent, 
Nevertheless, my grandpa always reminded me that the devil is in the details. So let's take a closer look and you can decide what's best for your photos. Additionally, if your old photos have physical damage or discoloration, you can restore them to their former glory by clicking on the link regarding photo restoration in the description. I'll make sure they look as good as new. My dear friends, it has been an incredible journey of wonder and excitement, and I thank you for joining me on this ride. It has been an honor to share my love of magic and mystery with you, and I hope that you have enjoyed the experience as much as I have. If you have found this video to be enjoyable and informative, then please do me the honor of hitting that like button and sharing it with your friends and family. The more people we can bring into this world of history, the better. And if you're hungry for more, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I have many more illusions and escapes up my sleeve, and I cannot wait to share them with you. But before we part ways, my friends, I have one final request for you. In the comments section below, I would like you to share your favorite historical figures that you would like to see featured in my next videos. Thank you once again for joining me on this journey of mystery and intrigue. Until next time, keep your minds open and your hearts full of wonder.